Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Sharon Noble, director of the BC Coalition to Stop Smart Meters. Merry Christmas, Sharon. Thank you very much, Jim, and the same to you. Well, do you have a lot to be merry about for the past year and what's been happening with the smart meter issue? Not really. Well, you know, I say that kind of with trepidation. Hydro is still a bully. The government still is disconnecting people and harassing people. The government still isn't doing anything, neither is the NDP. But the people are are sticking with this. Even though they've been smetered, with, even though they've got meters on the homes that they don't want, they're sticking with this battle. They're talking legal actions. They're talking um, that their charter rights have been infringed upon. They know that their lives and property are being put in and at risk because of the fire issue and because of the radiation issue. So people are much more aware now about the dangers and more concerned about going forward with this, not just accepting it. So with that regard, I think, you know, it's a, that's a positive. What about other people around the world who don't want smart meters? How successful have they been? It depends. Um, in places like California, where it hasn't been mandated, they've been very successful. They've gone to the Public Utilities Commission, and they are allowed to keep their analogs for $5 a month. They can keep their analogs permanently. And Hydro says no one's doing it, that the grid would break down, that analogs aren't available. These are just a few of the lies that Hydro is telling Places like California and other places in the U.S., people are fighting for the rights to keep their analogs. Of course, all the utility companies come on very, very strongly and say, you know, we need to have this for the grid. Won't and they say the same lies? You hear the same lies. They're, it's as if they've been handed out in packages. But eventually, if the people um, have the right to protest, they're getting the right to keep their analogs. Now, in many states. They're trying to make it a law, as they have in British Columbia, that you don't have a right. If you want to have electricity, if you want this essential service, you have to give up your right to what you have on your home. This isn't going on. What, uh, this isn't going well with most Americans. They're more litigious than Canadians, and they're more willing to take people to court and to fight for their rights. And I'm hoping that maybe we'll get a few legal cases here in Canada, where individuals take hydro and Fortis, and in other provinces, for instance, in Ontario, people are furious there. Thousands and thousands of people are being faced with huge bills, gigantic bills that they can't afford. They're having to choose between heat and food, and if they can't pay their electricity bill, they're being cut off. There is rancor throughout Canada and the North and North America about these things. And Every place, for instance, well, in the UK, for instance, and in Australia, they're asking, what are the benefits? We're not seeing any benefits. And in Ontario, the Auditor General said, has said the same thing and has in two or three annual reports, there's absolutely no benefits to justify the costs. And certainly these people who have their electricity turned off because they can't pay the fees, the time of use billing, the smart meter, the increase in all of the programs that are being put through that cannot be justified are raising the fees horribly, just as they are going to be in British Columbia. We don't have time of use billing yet. We will. We haven't seen the full impact of all these stupid, unnecessary programs like Site C, 
but we will. A time will come when people will have to choose, and it won't be just a few. It'll be a lot of people have to choose about which bill they're going to pay. How does that make you feel that we're paying? How much does it cost us to put in these smart meters? How long are they going to last, and what's the replacement cost for the replacement? The cost per meter, and I've explained this before, and I've got it on my website. I've been tracking the cost for a program and dividing that by the number of meters being installed. So in some places, there will be more work needed because if you have a mesh grid, you've got to put in collectors and more cell towers and stuff. I've divided it in British Columbia remains the highest in North America at $555 per smart meter. And the life expectancy was given as more than 20 years to justify this cost when, when Hydro and Fortis presented before the BC Utilities Commission and in their business case. And they knew at the time when they said this is, it was a bald-faced lie. No computer lasts 20 years or more. And these things are pieces of plastic. They're not metal and glass like the analogs that have lasted 30 and 40 years. Some even have 50 years old, 50 year old um, analogs in their home. And even the industry admitted long before Hydro started putting these on homes that it was probably closer to 12 years. Well, now there is evidence and there are admissions before the U.S. Congress that it's closer to five years, between five and seven years, and some say that's even overstated. So we're going to be facing replacement costs, and we already are in some places. In Ontario, they're already starting to replace their, their smart meters. We don't know if they're replacing them here because Hydro doesn't tell us what's going on. Many places have seen Hydro coming in and replacing the meters, and they don't know why. So the costs are going to continue to increase. It's a bottomless pit, and there's no end to it. But what's really bothering me and should bother everybody is the safety issue. Every time a meter is exchanged, the lugs on the base get wider, the gaps get wider, and there's a chance that there can be harm from a hot socket or something because hydro is not following good sound electric um, electrical practices. They are changing these things with that, on, that are live. They're not turning off the power at the home. And it's up to the homeowner to say, wait a minute, I want to turn off my power. If they don't, if they're not home, hydro just changes it. Every time the meter is changed, you're increasing the likelihood that there's going to be a fire. And now everyone practically has had their analogs taken and either an, another legacy meter put in. Some people have had their legacy meters put uh, removed and put in with another legacy meter, and now they've had a smart meter put in. That's two exchanges in a very short period of time, perhaps at least one, probably without anyone who had proper training. The Corex people didn't know what they were doing, and they smashed them in, and they, they were, were, were not careful. We don't know what the state of the bases are anymore, and the chances are it's going to get worse with each change of meter. So when the, the computer dies in three, four, five years and needs to be replaced, or if there's a software upgrade and so they have to take your smart meter, or if there's a new model that they want to put in, and this is happening all over the place, they're going to do another exchange. And this will expose your base to another uh, traumatic experience. So but there are many costs here, Jim, to what's happening. And it's not just dollars and cents. But the dollars and cents argument is major. And John Horgan and Adrian Dick should be jumping all over this because that's their bailiwick. These are expensive, and there's no end to them. Sharon, you're also very concerned that the World Health Organization has not stepped into the debate about whether we should be concerned about the high RF levels that smart meters and other devices generate. Not only that they're not stepping in, they're misleading. Um, in 2011, in May of 2011, the um, International Agency for Radiation Protection, um, which is an arm of the World Health Organization, found that the radiation from all wireless devices to be a 2B carcinogen. It's a possible human carcinogen. That's the same classification where they put lead, HIV, 
DDT and other things. This is something that the World Health Organization has been downplaying. They, like Kendall and some of the other health professionals and Health Canada say, well, it is also the same as uh, the pickling agent in vegetables in Asia. Yes, that's true. The pickling agent has been found to be carcinogenic. But worse, they are ignoring science. The reason IARC um, classified it as a possible human carcinogen was because they didn't feel that there was a clear path to explain why it's happening. Now, of course, people still don't understand exactly why people get lung cancer, but people know that cigarettes cause it. It took a heck of a long time to make that connection because the industry was paying. And the same thing is happening with cell phones. People know that people who use cell phones and use them long and have used them since they were young, which seems to be a very important key, that there's a very good chance that you're going, a higher chance than normal that you're going to get a brain tumor. There are more and more cases now where um, very young people are suffering um, glioblastomas and other very serious brain conditions. Now, the World Health Organization is supposed to be reviewing the newest data that's been coming out over the last five years that explain the mechanisms. The scientists have been concentrating their efforts and have come out with major studies that have shown that this, in fact, is happening and they're explaining why it happens. They've found two or three very important mechanisms. And the World Health Organization is supposed to be reviewing the science. They've set up the panel. And the panel is made up of all the people who have reviewed the things before, similar to the way it happened with Health Canada. Health Canada, with their Safety Code 6 panel, appointed all these people, James Mulder, Ken Foster, Daniel Kruski, all of these people who over and over and over again have shown themselves to be biased toward industry, toward the status quo, and in some cases have direct conflicts of interest. The same thing is happening with the World Health Organization. They, uh, I'm sorry, the World Health Organization in this panel has named many people who are directly um, affected and, and work with the industry, and especially with the with ICNRP, which is the international co uh, commission that has set the standards. It was, it's loaded with military people and corporate people. This was the purpose of it initially, and it hasn't changed. And the World Health Organization panel is going to be loaded with these people. And worse, the the director of the project to review the standards is an engineer, Emily DeVenter. I don't know if that's how you pronounce her name or not. That's how it looks. She's, an, she's a, um, a physicist, and she has worked with people in the industry for years. And she's heading this up, and she's naming the panel. We've got some major petitions and letters going around. Olga Sheehan has presented um, a petition. And in the petition, she is asking for the head of the World Health Organization project, the EMF project, to be replaced, to be recalled because of her conflicts of interest and her noted biases. I hope that people will look on our website and find that petition. I'll make sure it's upfront and easy for people to find. Um, Olga has connections with people at the United Nations where she once worked, and she also worked for the World Health Organization. And she is going to try to, if we can get 10,000 signatures, she believes that this will be enough to get some major attention. I've sent this petition to groups all over the world because this is not just a Canadian issue. It is a worldwide issue. And I'm asking people, if you find this petition, please, online, send it to your friends, send it to your neighbors, send it to your politicians. This is important. And just yesterday, um, I, I read uh, a letter that's been written by the uh, Bioinitiative Group, a group of major scientists who have reviewed all the studies that were presented in two groups, 2008 and 2012. And they have found and reported on so many harmful effects. They are petitioning um, the World Health Organization 
to review its information, to review the makeup of its panel, and to be honest looking at the science. It's time. The evidence is here, and it's too important, especially to the young generation. We've got to get science to be considered seriously. It's time for the World, World Health Organization to speak the truth and to stop hiding and trying to obfuscate so that people can no longer hide and, um, behind um, ICNRP and all these things like Health Canada is. Health Canada Safety Code 6 is the way it is, not understanding and not admitting that uh, non-thermal radiation is dangerous. They still say it, if it doesn't heat you, it doesn't hurt you. This is old. It's been decades since anyone, any true science, believed that. But Health, but Health Canada is using that because they can. That's what the World Health Organization is allowing to happen. So we have to get the World Health Organization to do what is what is right, and it's through signing these petitions, writing your your politicians, writing those people in in Ottawa. You know, Jane Philpot, who's the new Minister of Health in Ottawa, I've heard that she's a very reputable doctor, that she is willing to do the right thing. She's just overwhelmed right now being relatively new and facing all these other crises. We've got to get these people to support this because it's just too important. Our children are being exposed every day to Wi-Fi in schools and things like this. It can't continue. And as you're saying, there's safer alternatives. Yes. Yes, Wi-Fi in schools. Most schools have fiber optic cable. There's no reason to have Wi-Fi. There's no reason to have cell phones in your home or cordless phones in your home. We all have cor access to corded phones. We should use our corded phones. Turn your cell phones off. Don't use them in your home. If you have to use them outside when you're traveling, I guess you have to. But you shouldn't use them in your home when you're sleeping or your children are sleeping. We shouldn't have the smart meters. There are so many things we can do to reduce the exposure. We'll never eliminate it anymore. That cat seems to be out of the bag. But industry has always come up when it's been challenged. You know, they challenge people, you know, with the cars. People were having too many accidents. What they do, they made us use seatbelts. They put in um, those cushions that blow out when, when you hit something. Industry will react. We did, Right now, we're letting them get off cheap and we're letting them get off easy. We shouldn't. Let's push them. Provide these services safely. They're doing it in other countries. Why can't we do it here? We'll have more with Sharon Noble right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. In Goddard, we trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Sharon Noble. Sharon, we're seeing national news stories about poor folks in Ontario being cut off from their power supply without any notice. Is that happening in British Columbia? Well, it has been. Um, and a lot of people are suffering the consequences of it. There were people, um, for instance, I'll name them, AT Maintenance out of Nanaimo, O'Brien Stevenson was coming to people's homes, not knocking, not doing anything, and just going and, and if the meter had a cover on it or if they had a sign on it saying, do not touch my analog, he was cutting power. There were quite a few people up, up island here on uh, Vancouver Island who lost power during the cold period, and one person even told me that he was he laughed at her and said, I hope you enjoy the dark. This is a pretty frightening thing. And the Hydro had told um, the BC Utilities Commission when they were doing the most recent tariff change that they were going to be implementing a pilot project uh, to not cut people off during the winter. And I do have their policy here. In fact, um, it's available on our website if people would like to see it. But I can read it quickly. 
It says from no this is for the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island. From November first, two thousand sixteen to March thirty first, two thousand seventeen, you won't be disconnected for non payment. If the forecasted daily average temperature for the next twenty four hours is below zero degrees. When it warms up, you'll be disconnected if you still haven't paid your bill. Now, they don't say. They're just saying paying your bill. If people are refusing smart meters, I believe they will disconnect you. They're heartless and they're bullies. Now, for the rest of British Columbia, it says, if you live outside the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island, you won't be disconnected for non-payment between November 1st and March 31st. If you don't pay your bill, you'll still continue to receive payment notices, late payment charges, and could be as assessed a security deposit. Disconnections for non-payment will start again on April 1st. If you are disconnected, you will have to pay the full outstanding balance to resume your electricity service. Now again, they don't say anything about refusing smart meters. This is the first time they've had non, um, a policy for disconnections, as I understand. We'll see how they go. I think um, I heard, as a matter of fact, I received an email. I don't have the full details yet because I just received the email yesterday, and I wrote back asking for information. But there was an older gentleman who used a medical device, and he was cut off. Don't I think his neighbor um, ran an extension cord over so that he could keep his machine going. But this is what's happening right now. How ashamed are you of the government for allowing this to happen? Probably just as ashamed as you are, Jim. This is a democracy. This is our crown corporation. We own hydro. People keep forgetting. We own it. These people work for us. But they don't see it that way. They're running it into the ground. They're bullying people. They're harassing people. And they're putting people in situations where their lives are being put in danger. All for the sake of a bloody friggin' smart meter. A smart meter that has no benefits to anybody except their corporate buddies. This infuriates me. It doesn't just embarrass me, Jim. It infuriates me, and this is why I continue fighting it so hard. Well, when the judge didn't give you certification for your class action suit, didn't she give you some hope saying, well, you do kind of have a basis based on the Charter of Rights for you to have personal security, safety, and no health risk. Yeah. But she also said it was base, It was a better argument for individuals to bring forward, not for a class action. Did she volunteer to be your lawyer? <laughs> Wouldn't that have been nice? Yeah, sure. No, you know, I think when she said it, she was probably fully aware that uh, this wasn't likely to happen. Hydro has a whole bunch of lawyers that we pay for and I've been told that they charge $700 an hour you know to fight these people you've got to either have a very very deep pocket or you've got to find a, a legal group who will take it on a contingency basis now we both know that if you take it on a contingency basis the lawyer has to have a way of getting money and I presented this to a couple of lo uh, legal groups I presented an argument to one of them, a larger group. I won't name it, but it's a, it's a group that has done a lot of class actions against BC Hydro and the government. The fact is, there is great discrimination going on with fees. We've discussed this before. There are many people who have smart meters who are having them manually read and are not paying any fees. Hydro says this is because they've got the meter. It's not their fault. While the people right next door with an analog meter that is still functioning perfectly are paying $32.40 a month for services that are supposed to be additional and special. I have written to the BC Utilities Commission and Hydro. I want to know what those special services are. Initially, they told me when I asked years ago, I guess in 2013, when they brought these fees in, I asked what the special services were, and they said it's, it's because the, uh, most of these people who have smart meters that are being read manually live in rural areas where the infrastructure isn't up and going. When I asked them why are they being given smart meters, why can't they keep their analogs, I was told, well, 
the smart meters, even if they're not working, still gather information that's important to us, which to my mind means that they're gathering personal data that's not needed for billing purposes. That's another issue. But anyhow, recently, within, say, since September, October, I've learned that many of these smart meters that are being read manually are, in fact, in urban areas where there is the infrastructure. Why are they being read manually? I don't know. They won't tell me. But why are they being read manually? And you've got the analog next door, and the person is paying thirty two forty. I want to know what additional services are being provided for the thirty two forty. If you're reading both manually, you go from one door to the next door. You go yet on Salt Spring. People are telling me that they come back separately. They read all of the smart meters one day that aren't working. Then they go back to the mainland, and then they bring the boat. They come back another day and read all the analogs. That makes no sense. I want to know, and I think we've got a legal argument to say that we are being discriminated against. Well, especially when you compare the BC charge to what's being charged in other provinces yes. and in U.S. states. Well, I want to know what those additional charges are, Jim. If you take when we first started this, when the legacy fees first came out in, in December of 2013, we had close to 200,000 homes that, had, that were going to take the legacy meters. People gradually dropped out because they couldn't afford the 30 to 40 a month. We still have 15,000 who are paying this legacy fee. Just take 20,000 as an average, and that's a low average. Take it thirty two forty a month for three years. You've got well over twenty million dollars that Hydro has taken from us, and I believe taken illegitimately. I believe we've got cause for legal action, and the one legal group that I took it to so far that has taken a lot of uh, taken a lot of such cases told me that they thought we had a very legitimate case. They just didn't have room for it right now. Their workload is too heavy. I'm going to keep finding and searching for a lawyer because I believe we should be taking hydro to court. And I believe we've got a way to pay a lawyer who's willing to take this case on a contingency basis. $20 million? That's a lot of money that we've had stolen from us. And it's continuing. I still have my analog, and I'll have a, my analog. I think expires next year, or maybe the year after. I'll keep paying my thirty-two forty, but I don't know why I have to. It's extortion, and it's just another bullying tactic. So many people want to keep their analogs, but they can't afford it. And some people have two and three meters. You know, if people have, for instance, a greenhouse, or if they've got a, a workshop or they've got a, a, another suite in their home, they've got more than one meter that they're paying for. That's a lot of money. Electrical engineers, you say, are now speaking out about smart meters. Can you give us any examples? Yeah, I've been speaking to, over the last three years with a lot of electrical meters. I'm sorry, electrical engineers. And some of them are now willing to come out and speak publicly there's one in the U.S. who's been uh, speaking before uh, utility boards. His name is William Bathgate, and he lives in an area where they have ITRON meters, same model we have. He took it apart, and he found the very same design flaws that the electrical uh, engineers here in British Columbia have found, and which I've been writing to BC Hydro about, to the government, to the BC Utilities Commission warning that they're fire hazards. He took them apart and he said he will never allow an ITRON meter to be put on his home because he knows that they are dangerous. He's speaking out a lot about the ITRON meter. And I believe that the Utility Commission and BC Hydro are guilty of negligence for allowing this to continue. They knew that these meters were dangerous when they put them on our home or at least they sure should have. I want to know what due diligence they did. And I've asked for this through a Freedom of Information Act that I haven't received an answer to yet. I want to know when they bought these things, who at Hydro 
looked and inspected the meters? What were his qualifications? Did he look and determine that these things were safe to be put on the homes? Because ITRON had had fires long before Hydro signed that contract. Who blew it? Somebody did not do their due diligence, or else we would not have these things on our home. And a very interesting thing now to consider, Jim, when I first approached John Horgan in 2010 about these meters, I said, what we need are safe wired meters. What we need are uh, fiber optic cable connections because fiber optic cable is more efficient, it's faster, it's safer, and it doesn't irradiate us. It would protect our data far more than having it um, sent wirelessly through the air where any teenager with a computer can hack it. But he was right. In 2010, he said, we can't afford to put a fiber optic network across the province. Well, TELUS is doing that now. TELUS is putting fiber optic cable in every neighborhood and running the fiber optic cable right to people's homes. Whether you want their services or not, they're putting that box on the side of your home. I don't know what else they're going to do with that box. Um, I've expressed my concern before that you know they mislead people and they're putting wireless technology into your home, but that's not my concern right now. I propose that if ITRON smart, uh, wireless smart meters were recalled, as they should be, these things in our house should be recalled and we should get our money back. And we could get smart meters, safe design smart meters. New designs are safer. And they could be wired. They could be wired and connected to the fiber optic cable. This would eliminate so many of the problems. I don't know. I haven't investigated whether they pose fire hazards. But I'm th throwing this out as a consideration that people like John Horgan and Bill Bennett, if he is actually interested in saving the smart meter program and protecting the people, let's look at the fiber optic options now. TELUS is invested in putting this across the province. Fiber optic cable is capable of handling a lot of data, far more data than you know a wired connection versus on a, a power line or sending it wirelessly. It is much safer in so many ways. And we've got that option now. I would like to wonder, I would like to ask people, why isn't this being considered? Sharon, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I hope you and your family have a great Christmas and a very happy New Year. Thank you very much, Jim. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And I hope your listeners will look at our website, www.stopsmartmetersbc.com. And I hope they have a good, safe Christmas and a very, very happy New Year. My guest has been Sharon Noble, Director of the BC Coalition to Stop Smart Meters. You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is TalkDigitalNetwork. Questions can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Happy Holidays! Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.